One of the most misunderstood relationships in all the Bible is uh, the relationship between God's law and God's grace. Some people think God's law was given as a way for us to earn his favor, uh, to earn our way into heaven. Uh, most religions today have some sort of uh, earn your way theology. Uh, others say salvation is by grace alone, through faith. Now, the Bible has its share of thou shalt and thou shalt not, but it also talks a lot about grace. So which is it? Or if it's both, how do they fit together? Now, the best way for us to understand the relationship is by looking at the most famous list of laws uh, in history and the story about how they came to be given to us. I'm talking about the Ten Commandments. In this, the third in our series of messages, the original top ten. The story about how God gave us the commandments is as important as the commandments themselves. Uh, the context surrounding how God uh, gave us the commandments helps resolve this tension between God's law and God's grace. As we will see, the Ten Commandments do not stand in contrast to grace. Uh, they are introduced within the story of God's grace. So God invites Moses to come up Mount Sinai to, the, to receive the commandments. And here's what he says to him. He, here's how he begins. I am the Lord your God. Moses must have thought, God, did you say, Lord, your God? Did you mean to say, Lord, the God? I mean, Lord, your God implies a relationship, but the Israelites hadn't done anything to earn a relationship with God. As slaves for 400 years in Egypt, I imagine many of them thought God had abandoned them, and maybe some didn't even believe in God anymore. So using the phrase, your God, affirmed that the Israelites already had a relationship with God. He said in so many words to Moses, you're in. You're my people. So before he gave us the Ten Commandments, he showed grace. So he says to Moses, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led them out of slavery by grace. They didn't do anything to earn God's favor. He, he was very clear to Moses, you're, you're not up here to get in with me. You're already in. Uh, these commands are not being given so you can earn a relationship. You already have that. God initiated a relationship with his people before he even told them what the rules were. So the commandments are not given as a way for us to establish a relationship with God. They're given to confirm an existing relationship. The Ten Commandments are an expression of God's grace. Let me see if I can convince you. When Moses talks to the Israelites about the Ten Commandments that God gave him, this is what he says. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. He doesn't tell them he gives them the command so they can earn his favor, earn their way into heaven. Uh, there's, instead, it's all about so that you can prosper in the land God is giving you. So that you can have lots of children, you can uh, live well, you can be blessed. So the commandments are an expression of God's grace. They show us how life is meant to be lived best 
how we're meant to live. So we don't keep the Ten Commandments to earn God's favor. God made a choice to love us by His grace. We enter into that relationship by faith, accepting His forgiveness for our sins through Christ's death on the cross. And only then do we become accountable to live out the Ten Commandments, His prescription for how we live best. So now we're ready for the third uh, command. This is Exodus 20, verse 7. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses His name. Uh, The first commandment tells us we're to worship the right God. The second commandment says we're to worship the right God, not just a shadow of Him. The third commandment says even His name is to be held in honor. Uh, Every time we utter God's name or we sing it, we just sang, we're to do it thoughtfully. We're not to use His name flippantly or mechanically or profanely. Does it really matter to God if we misuse His name? What's the big deal about all this? Uh, Perhaps you feel like the little boy who let slip a little word in uh, front of his parents and his dad heard the word all the time at work so he didn't even notice but his mom was horror struck and so she told him to leave the table and go to your room and stay there all night well after uh, she'd sent him away a storm blew in and lightning you know flashed and thunder crashed and rain splashed and she began to worry about her her little boy And so she slipped upstairs and she quietly opened the door to see how he was doing. And she could see him silhouetted against the window. And he's he's saying, God, all this for a little word? Come on. Let me, uh, there's probably a lot of ways we can misuse God's name. But let me talk about four. One is when we use God's name profanely. This is probably the way we most frequently think of this commandment, profanity. A third commandment tells us to avoid cursing God's name. Uh, We're not to use His name profanely when we're we're angry, uh, when a child spills milk on the floor, or dinner is burned because it was left in the oven too long or in the microwave too long. when we're cut off in traffic, when we slam our finger in a door, uh, when we bang our shin. I mean, it just happened to me this week, and you know, everything within me is crying out to say something to release my anger. so painful. Uh, when the baby cries at night. I also throw in this uh, a foul language. Apostle Paul says, nor should there be obscenity, Foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Or not to use crude language or uh, dirty jokes. I tried using one such word when I was in third grade. I was uh, riding on the school bus and uh, I heard some four letter words that were never spoken in our house. And I probably wouldn't have thought much about it, but they were spoken by the the big kids in the school, the kids everybody looked up to, uh, the sixth graders. I went to a K through sixth grade. And, uh, you know, uh, they used the words casually, you know, like a, a no big deal attitude. So I thought, well, yeah, I could maybe use some of these words to, you know, put some color to my language. So at dinner... We're sitting around, my mom and dad and my sister, and my dad asked me how, how my day went. And, uh, you know, I said, it wasn't that great. It wasn't that great a day. Uh, and then I thought to, you know, add a little spice to my recap, um, I'd, I'd throw in one of these words. You know, kind of in a nonchalant, no big deal sort of way. And um, no sooner had I said that, the word that I knew that was a mistake. My sister had a look of shock. My mom's m- mouth dropped open 
and my dad shot out of his chair and he picked me up underneath my armpits and began to carry me down the stairs to the basement. Well, I knew what we were going to do down there. <laughs> and so I looked over his shoulder as he's carrying me down and my sister is beaming from ear to ear. I said, Dad, I didn't know. You know, I heard from the big kids saying that word. I'm sorry. Um, so we're to avoid using any word, words that don't bring honor to God's name. Now, how many of you had moms who would use soap as an entree when you'd have a potty mouth? Um, I had a mom like that. And, uh, you know, you say, you say a bad word and mom's like, ah, ha, ha, let's get some soap, Okay. And uh, my mom's idea was, you know, I, I use a bad word and she's got to wash my mouth out with soap. Another way we misuse God's name is when we use it frivolously. Uh, we don't use his name to, to praise him or to, um, uh, you know, confess our sins or to ask something of him, but we use it just carelessly, jokingly. How about this one? Lord, have mercy. You know, you're shopping in the store and price of uh, some groceries has gone up and you say, Lord, have mercy. Or your kids come in and they're, 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 their clothes are dirty from playing outside. Lord, have mercy. I mean, what, is, what does God have to do with uh, price of, prices going up or, or uh, your child uh, getting dirty out playing outside? Or how about social media texting, OMG? What do you think? Should we be throwing out OMG in our texting and our posts, our social media? Uh, should we be saying, oh my God, in our conversations with people? Um, probably not a good idea. Probably not the best way to show honor to God's name. Still another way we um, misuse God's name is when we use it hypocritically. We come to worship on Sunday. We sing the songs as the band leads us. Uh, but we don't really sing passionately or fervently uh, praise God. We're just kind of going through the motions. Uh, Jesus said of the Pharisees, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus reserved his strongest rebukes not for non-believers, but for those who claimed to be believers, but were hypocrites. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Jesus says using his name is not a guarantee that we're honoring him or that we even know him. We can be hypocrites. Still a fourth way we can misuse God's name is when we use it dishonestly. Uh, we use God's name as a cloak for our dishonesty. We don't tell the truth, so to get people to believe us, we use phrases like, swear to God. I swear to God I didn't do it. Or how about uh, this one? As God is my witness. As God is my witness, I'm telling you the truth. Or how about this one? I swear on a stack of... Bibles. Don't just bring me one Bible. Bring me a stack up to here. I'll swear on them all. People don't believe us when we talk, so we have to swear on something religious. Here's the little kid's version. Cross my heart, hope to die. I never uh, told my kids to throw in that last part. I mean, really? Hope to die? Seriously? Folks in the Old Testament understood the concept of using God's name as a cloak for dishonesty. Today, if you want to borrow money, get a mortgage, uh, you go to the bank, and they want to do a credit check. 
or they do a credit check. Well, the, old, the Israelites didn't have a way to do a credit check. Um, so how would, how would people know if you'd repay? You'd use an oath. You'd say something like, God do such and such to me if I don't keep my word. God judge me if, you know, it's like, I know God sees me making this commitment to you and um, God will hold me accountable. Uh, so, uh, I'll swear on his name. Well, that somehow convinced people. Uh, but after a while, people got casual. Uh, after a while, the Israelites called on God's name, but they didn't really mean it. A phrase like, a phrase like as the Lord lives, which became quite common, became empty words. Although they spoke God's name, they didn't consider themselves accountable. They emptied God's name of consequences. Not only did they make promises they never intended to keep, but they practiced evasive oath-taking. Uh, they taught that only oaths taken in God's name were binding. If you swear by uh, the temple or the altar or heaven or the earth or Jerusalem, those were non-binding. It's sort of like uh, today making a promise with your hand behind your back, with your finger crossed, you know, then, then I don't really mean it. Uh, Jesus tells us what he thinks of this kind of dishonesty in the Sermon on the Mount. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Uh, the reason... Uh, Jesus says it comes from the evil one is because he, he taught that Satan is a liar from the beginning. The, the Pharisees taught that only making an oath on God's name was binding. Uh, but Jesus says there's nothing on earth that you can swear by that's not binding because God owns everything. So what should we do? Jesus says don't swear at all. Uh, the only reason we swear by a stack of Bibles or say, cross my heart, hope to die, is because people won't believe us otherwise. But Je Jesus says, become so honest that people will know. When you say yes, you mean yes. When you say no, you mean no. When you give your word, you'll keep it. Then you won't need to add words like scout's honor or honest to God. People will just believe you. Here's another one. We misuse God's name when we mention that we're Christians or that we go to church to get people to believe us. We're, we're doing a, maybe a business deal and uh, to, to assure them that we're good people. We tell them that we're Christians or we go to church. A Baptist deacon was selling a cow and a prospective buyer said, well, how much, uh, how much are you selling it for? He says, $250. How many gallons of milk does it give? It says four gallons a day. Well, how do I know that the cow will really give that? And he says, oh, you can trust me. I'm a Baptist deacon. The guy says, I'll buy it. He says, I'll take it home and I'll bring you back the, the money later. You can trust me because I'm a Lutheran elder. Well, the guy goes home later and he asks his wife, what's a Lutheran elder? She says, it's about the same as a Baptist deacon. He says, oh, no, I've lost my cow. <laughs> if we always tell the truth, people will believe us because we keep our word. The Ten Commandments are an expression of God's grace. They show us that the way to live is not to misuse God's name. We don't need to swear by God's name to get people to believe us. They simply know that we'll do what we say we'll do. 
We don't need to use God's name or we don't want to use God's name in a foul way or in a cursing way because we want to bring honor to God's name. The best way to avoid misusing God's name is to honor His name. All the, all the Ten Commandments have a, a negative prohibition and then they have a grand positive. Uh, do not commit adultery is the negative prohibition. The grand positive is be faithful to your spouse. Love your mate. Uh, do not covet is the negative prohibition. The grand positive is celebrate other people's, God's grace in other people's lives. Don't be jealous of them. And here... The negative prohibition is do not misuse God's name. And the grand positive is honor his name. So how do we do this? Uh, Jesus taught his disciples about honoring God's name. His disciples came to him and they saw him pray. And they knew that compared to him, you know, their prayers were nothing short of pathetic. And so Jesus taught them to pray. He says, when you pray... Say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. After establishing that we call God Father because he loves us, he says the top priority is to hallow God's name. God's name is to be revered. Uh, his name should only be used in ways that bring him honor and glory. Our whole life is about bringing honor to God so we only want to speak ways that bring honor to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these Ten Commandments. We see that they are an expression of your grace. They're not a way to earn your favor, earn our way into heaven. We can't ever do that. Uh, they're an expression of your grace. They show us the way we live best, the way life works best for us. And we see that one of your commandments is don't misuse your name. We don't, that's not the way to live. To curse your name, to use foul language. Uh, and so we, we ask you to forgive us for misusing your name, for ways we've done that. And uh, ask, us, ask you to help us to honor your name this week. I want to give you just a minute to respond to God today. Maybe, maybe you confess ways that you know that you misuse God's name or have you want to just ask him to forgive you and maybe you want to make a commitment that this week you want to live uh, only using his name as a way to honor him you pray just silently Thank you, God, for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray.